We're going to hear God's word this morning from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. Jim, I'm going to ask if you could slip, flip slides for me. That'd be great. Thanks. 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll begin at verse 13. Um, before we even approach God's word this morning, um, I want you to, to recognize, in some sense, the irony with me of, uh, of who the author of this, this letter is, but then also recognize the comfort that it should bring you. First um, Peter is called First Peter because it's written by Peter. Good. So um, Peter is, if, if you ask someone who, who says, you know, uh, who of the disciples is the loud mouth? Peter, Peter right? Who is the disciple who uh, never looks before he leaps? Peter. Peter. Uh, who is the disciple who's probably the last person to talk about self-control? Peter. So we're going to Peter for self-control. Um, this is ironic because in some ways in his life as a disciple, he, like I said, he showed probably the, the least amount of self-control, the, the least amount of foresight as far as thinking before doing things. And at the same time, this gives me comfort and hope because if God can take someone who tended to be a loudmouth, who tended to be someone who lacked self-control, who tended to be someone who never looked before he leaped, and can make him into an expert on self-control, then he can make any of us, no matter where we are, no matter what kind of material we have to work with, he can make any of us into people of self-control too. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. Therefore, Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. If you paid any attention to the news this week, there was a big, scandalous story that broke in the news this week. Next slide. And that was the story of AshleyMadison.com. How many of you heard the news stories about AshleyMadison.com? Um, AshleyMadison.com is a website, for those who aren't aware, um, God bless you. Uh, AshleyMadison.com is a website that is designed for spouses to have affairs with other spouses. And so this is a picture from Ashley Madison's website. Uh, you notice that she is putting her finger over her mouth to, you know, let's keep things quiet. And you notice, too, that she has a ring on her ring finger. Right? This, is, this is the picture of, of an adulterous wife and, and the, the, the picture of temptation to say, hey, this is, this is something attractive, this is something good. The motto on their website is, life is short, have an affair. Wow. Right? You talk about corruption, you talk about how messed up our society is. Life is short, have an affair. Unbelievable. And what's even more unbelievable is that thousands of people a day sign up for accounts on AshleyMadison.com. It's unknown whether people actually follow through on it or whether people, as some have been saying this past week, are just curious and just kind of looking around out of curiosity. Uh, why this was a big story this past week is because about a month ago, hackers said, we have hacked into AshleyMadison.com and we have all their data on their users. The owners of the website said, no, there's no way that you have that data. Come on, you're just, you're calling our bluff. And they said, no, we have this data. And so this past week, they released a 10 gigabyte file 
of data that users had, and, and it had a list of email addresses and all kinds of things like that, and um, just a lot of scandalous stuff because there's famous people's email addresses, there's .edu, there's .gov, there's, you know, all these leaders that are supposedly signed up to this site, and then you know, they don't follow a verification process so that if you sign up, I'm told, if you sign up and give your email address, you don't have to get a link from them to confirm your account to that email address. And so, so then the defense was, well, you know, maybe someone put in my email address. You know, honey, there's no way that I signed up for this. And so the hackers decided, we'll go a step further. And so they released the last four digits of credit card information that people had given when they signed up in order to sign up for this service. And uh, from what I hear, divorce lawyers are just rubbing their hands together in anticipation because this is something that is going to be a boom for their industry. Now here's the really, it's all messed up, but here's the really messed up part. These hackers did this not to expose cheating spouses, but the reason they did this was to expose bad IT practice. Because what they wanted to show was that AshleyMadison.com had done a poor job of making a promise to delete users' information. There was this, this deal where they said, you know, for $14, you can delete all your personal information. You can cover your tracks. It was like you never, never looked for an affair, and so no one will ever know for $14. In 2014, the company raised over $2 million from users who were trying to cover their tracks. These hackers were upset because they said, you took in $2 million to delete their information, but you really didn't delete it. And so they wanted to expose the company for not deleting the information. So let me lay it out for you. The hackers were more upset that the company didn't keep its word about data security than the fact that thousands of people a day aren't keeping their word before their family and friends, before their pastor, before God, when they said, in sickness and in health, for better or worse, till death do us part. This is the world we live in. It's broken, needs Jesus, and it needs self-control. So that's what we're going to study today. Um, what you notice in our text is, um, and, and we'll see throughout this message today, is first that this is a very blunt quality, self-control. Uh, there is no dressing up self-control. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a song on the radio about self-control. There are countless love songs that have been written, but um, you never hear any songs about the virtue of self-control, right? I'll always have self-control. You know, I, I have self-control for you now, and I always will. I, I don't hear any songs like that for some reason. Um, I, I looked up the definition of self-control because I thought maybe this will give me some insight. I'm not even kidding. This is what it says. Uh, it's the ability to control oneself. <laughs> I didn't think that dictionaries were supposed to define words with the exact same words. But yeah, self-control is controlling yourself. Um, so not all that helpful. Um, but it gets at the fact that it's pretty self-evident what self-control is. It's the ability to control yourself. Um, you, can't, you can't avoid it. Right? It's pretty obvious, pretty clear. And Paul says it's a fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's what Paul is saying and when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit is that the Holy Spirit works in you and brings out that quality of self-control in you. Somehow that ability to control yourself comes out by the work of the Holy Spirit. So what we'll do today is think about this concept in Christian life in general. We'll think about it in marriage, and then we'll be encouraged that God gives us this fruit from the Holy Spirit. What we notice first in our passage is that we're called to prepare our minds for action. That's what verse 13 says. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. I think it's important to recognize that much of self-control has to do with thinking things through. 
right? To put it in everyday terms, we have to look before we leap. We have to consider the consequences before doing something. So self-control involves that component of thinking with our minds. We have to say, what effect will this night of drinking have? What effect will the words I'm about to say have on myself and the people around me? What effect will my choice of music or movies or TV shows have on me? And then we exercise self-control because we have insight to say, I recognize this might not be good for me. Or we might say it on the other side, I recognize worshiping with God's people. I recognize listening to upbuilding things will be good and they will turn out well. Why is this so important? Why is it so important to be self-controlled? 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Peter says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We have to be self-controlled because there's a spiritual aspect to this. What a scary picture that Peter paints for us. Right? The devil is prowling around like a lion, just waiting for someone to be susceptible, waiting for someone that he can devour. And so the call is to resist, to stand firm in the faith, to know that Christians all over the world are facing the same temptations, but they're also overcoming the same temptations. You are not alone in your fight for self-control. This is common to all people, and it's something that God gives you the grace to overcome. But self-control is bigger than just our thoughts. This involves putting a stop to evil desires. And again, that's what the text says. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Peter here is making a clear distinction between the way that people who have Christ in their lives live versus the way that people who don't have Christ in their lives live. And you might say, well, it doesn't always look that way. And you might know of examples of Christians that you know who don't exercise self-control very well. And you might know people in your life who are not Christians who are really people of self-control. C.S. Lewis actually talks about this. And for, uh, for the example's sake, let's call them John, who's a non-Christian, and Bill, who's a Christian. We might say, John has a ton of self-control, even though he's not a Christian. And Bill has barely any self-control, even though he is a Christian. We might say, how can this be? Because Scripture says that the Holy Spirit brings about self-control. What we don't know is how much less self-control Bill would have if he weren't a Christian. Right? We might, instead of comparing Bill and John, what we have to do is compare who they would be without the Spirit's control in their lives, without self control showing up in their lives. And so we don't know how much less, less self control Bill would have if he weren't a Christian, or how much more self control John might have if he were a Christian. What we do know is that the Holy Spirit makes a difference, that He produces self control in us. I think all of us have had the experience, and sometimes it's illustrated really well in cartoons, of, of the little angel voice on the right shoulder and the little devil voice on the left shoulder. And, and all of us have had that experience where we're about to do something where we know we shouldn't do it, and then we ha hear that still, small voice, and it says, you're not really going to do this. You know you really shouldn't do this. And when it comes to our evil desires, what we're called to do as Christians is to listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. To not say, oh, I can just shut this voice up. I'm just going to listen to my sinful nature. I'm going to listen to my fleshly desires. I'm going to listen to the type of thing that a non-Christian would do. But instead we say, I have to be convicted. I have to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. And it's not just listening, say, okay, that's some pretty good advice. But we have to follow through on it too, right? We have to actually do what the Holy Spirit convicts us to do. That's what Galatians 5 talks about. 
Galatians 5.16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. This confirms what Peter is saying. Right? Be self-controlled. Don't have those same evil desires, but instead put a stop to them because of the Holy Spirit's work in your life. We recognize, too, it's, it's not just a matter of what the Spirit is convicting us of, but it changes the way we live. So it's not just internal. Even our actions change as far as self-control goes. It's clearly laid out for us in Philippians 2. Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. What you do is empowered and influenced by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. This is probably one of the most mysterious verses in all of Scripture. Um, and here's why. Uh, when, we, when we think about God's saving work in our lives, uh, we are quick to say that I am saved by Christ alone. Amen? Come on, a little bit louder. I am saved by Christ alone. Amen? Amen. 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 There we go. And I am saved by faith alone. Amen? Amen? Amen. And I am saved to the glory of God alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, good. We got this now. What's wild is we believe that, and we know that Scripture teaches that, and that's called monergism, that, that God alone is the one who works salvation for us. And yet we hear a passage like this, and we say, how does that work? Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. What you see there is some divine mystery of, yes, God empowering you to do what he's called you to do, but also the call of obedience to say, you have some responsibility in this. Right? It's not enough to just pray, God, lead me not into temptation. And then we say amen, and then we walk right into temptation ourselves. And, oh, well, God didn't prevent me. No, you can't do that. You can't have it both ways, right? You ask God to work in your life to convict you, to prevent you from going into sinful circumstances, and then you ask the Holy Spirit to work it out in you. And, and by your will and by your choice, you say, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that to protect myself, to not lead myself into temptation after asking God to not lead me into temptation. That idea about self-control reminds me of what Proverbs 25, verse 28 says. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. We could say a woman who lacks self-control too. Walls during that time when the book of Proverbs was written, walls were extremely important. Walls were, in some ways, the first and last line of defense against invaders, against people who would do harm, who would destroy the city. And that wisdom passage tells us that if we lack self-control, if we have no self-control in our lives, then we're like a city that doesn't have any walls. We're completely unprotected. We're asking for trouble. And we're called then to have walls in our lives. Self-control is that wall. And because of that, we have hope to control our desires in marriage. We have hope to control our desires and marriage. I'm going to tell you something you already know. I'm going to say it in PG terms um, for those who don't yet know it, who are too young to know it, um, that they won't know it yet because they don't need to. Um, when a person says, I do, when all of you said, I do, when my wife and I said, I do, 
there's still a desire for other people. Right? It's not as if immediately then, you know, that, that switch just got turned off and, you know, there's, there's no other people in the world. I only have eyes for her and I've got total blinders on and I can't recognize any beauty or good qualities in anyone else because, you know, she is my all and my everything. It makes for a good song, but reality is that, that there are temptations all around us, for guys and women both. And what we do when we recognize that is we, again, recognize that we have to keep good boundaries intact, that we have to keep walls intact, that we have to make sure that we're not susceptible to invaders. The Song of Solomon, if you're familiar with it, is a song between a husband and wife, and maybe two people who are engaged, with an occasional verse from friends who like to chime in from the outside, and it speaks about the beauty of the other, and it speaks about the attraction and the desires that they have for each other, and there's a sobering word in there too. It's Song of Solomon 2.15. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. Pretty sure that Solomon is not talking about the foxes we have in our church. Bob and Linda, Brent and Lindy, Kyle and Kelsey, or even Hayden. He's a little fox. Um, <laughs> Solomon's not talking about those foxes. As all of you know as well, I'm, I'm married to a fox myself. Um, again, I don't think that Solomon's talking about that fox either. Um, the foxes described here in Song of Solomon 2 are ones that break into a vineyard, break into a place that's supposed to have walls around it, that's supposed to be protected. And what the foxes do, we're told, is that they steal the fruit away from the vine, the fruit that's in bloom. And there are vines, say the beloved. There are vines. All of Song of Solomon is sexual, and this is sexual too. And so what it's saying is the love that we have for each other, the love that's develop, developed over time, the love that's grown into what it is, is specifically for the husband and wife to share together. And yet there's these little invaders that want to come in and steal away what's designed for and intended for each other. It's a good reminder for us in marriage, too, to say we need to know that those desires that we have, that those wants that we have need to be kept in check. We need to make sure that those little foxes don't sneak in and steal what's intended for my spouse. C.S. Lewis, again, was writing 70 years ago about marriage, and he says that what books and plays, and today we could say TV shows and movies, say is that falling in love is something that's completely inevitable. That uh, when, when someone comes into your life and you just fall for them, you have no control over it. That, that you know, your emotions and your hormones and everything just sort of takes over and you can't do anything about it and you just immediately fall in love. And what he says is, uh, in a sense, that's a good thing as far as people who are single, who are looking for a relationship. It becomes the spark plug that, that gets the engine going and, and the fuel of constant abiding love is what keeps the engine running. And but what he also says is that we're susceptible in some sense, and folks here can attest to it too, we're susceptible that in a married relationship that a little fox is going to sneak in and whether it's a coworker, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's someone from our past, whether it's at a high school reunion, whatever it might be, we see someone and there's something that, that sparks inside us a little bit and this sense of, boy, I really appreciate her beauty, and I really appreciate his listening ear, and I really appreciate the way that they're there for me. And, and that type of thing isn't something, brothers and sisters, isn't something that will inevitably lead to falling in love. I think that C.S. Lewis was a prophet 70 years ago to recognize how easy it is to believe the narratives that we hear all the time. Like, how could I help from falling in love? Well, if you're married to someone else, you can help 
from falling in love. And the way that you do it is by putting up healthy walls to make sure that that invader doesn't come into that relationship. It means that you don't start texting the person. It means you don't start private messaging the person. It means that you don't, oh, just for curiosity's sake, go check out Ashley Madison because, you know, what's the harm? I'm just, I'm just looking. It's not like I'm going to do anything. Right? That's where it starts, is that curiosity that, boy, I, I wonder if someone else could be the right person for me. No, if you want to know who the right person is for you, check your marriage license, Right? That's the single greatest way to figure out who's the right person for me. Check your marriage license. That's who the right person is for you. Self-control, the Holy Spirit's work in your life doesn't mean that you are someone who is completely subject to your hormones and to your chemical reactions in your body, but instead you're a person who has walls, who knows that your garden, who knows that your fruit is something that's kept intact for your beloved and hers is for you. Tim Keller recounts uh, Homer's Odyssey, right? That, that Greek mythology. Some of us read that back in high school. And in Homer's Odyssey, probably one of the, the most memorable characters in that story are the characters of the sirens. How many of you remember the sirens, the characters of the Odyssey? The sirens were these beautiful women who were on this island, and, and almost makes you kind of think of like, like mermaids almost, where their, their siren song, they call out to sailors who go by, and they say, oh, come check us out, oh, come see us. And, and so what sailors would do is, is take their ships off course, and they would head toward the island and say, oh, look at all these beautiful women, and oh, this is going to be great. And what would inevitably happen is that the ship would crash into the rocks off the shore of the Sirens Island and the ships would become shipwrecked and all the men aboard the ship would be completely destroyed. And what Homer's Odyssey describes is a picture of self-control because what the captain and the men on the ship decided was they knew that temptation was going to be there. They knew that there were these foreign women who'd be calling out to them, and they said, we have to do something to prevent these desires from shipwrecking us, from completely destroying us. And so the captain of the ship, remember what he did? The captain of the ship had all the men on the ship stuff wax into their ears, so they wouldn't hear the sirens calling out from the shore. So they wouldn't be tempted to go towards there and have everything destroyed. And he went a step further for himself. He said, don't just stuff wax in my ears. Remember this? Tie me to the mast. Because this way, it'll prevent me from saying, you know what, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe that temptation isn't so bad. Maybe we won't be shipwrecked. Maybe we'll be the exception to the rule. Maybe I can get away with it. No, he said, tie me to the mast to make sure that I do not succumb to the siren song. And that's the call for us in marriage, too. To say, how can I keep myself pure? How can I keep myself self-controlled? How can I make sure that I don't succumb to the siren song? Really, when you think about Scripture, there are clear commands how to treat our spouses. There's clear commands how to treat our spouses. You think about speech, and Ephesians 4.29 addresses the area of speech. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I think this is something... This is something that's not just out there, but something that's in here, that it is very easy for us, uh, not only who are married, but those who are talking about marriage, it's very easy to talk very negatively about marriage and about our spouses. Um, it's very easy to joke around about the burden of marriage, to talk about the old ball and chain, to talk about the warden, to talk about a million other put-downs that we can say as far as our relationships go. And yet, what this passage calls me to calls you to, is self-control. To say, is what I'm saying about the institution of marriage, and more specifically about my own spouse, does that build her up? Does that build him up? 
Do I look at my marriage, I look, look at the institution of marriage as something that is just this oppressive burden that prevents me from being free? Or do I recognize it as a blessing from God and as a gift and as a way to show God's love not only to my spouse but to the world around us? I say this too, a really somber moment here. I say this too because I think especially folks who lose their marriage, whether it's due to uh, reasons of, of choice or the loss of their spouse. I think I see over and over again people who say, boy, I don't realize how good I had it. I don't realize what I have until it's gone. I just want to encourage you to protect your marriage with your words, to use self-control. Because if you start saying those words, you start believing those words. And you start believing those words, then you start to resent your spouse. And things can really go downhill from there. It's not just that we don't say negative things about our spouse, but as Scripture says, we build them up. Right? We don't just give them a token compliment here and there to try to earn some points, but instead you become the student of your spouse. You learn about the deepest qualities of your spouse. You remember about the things that, that made that spark plug go in the first place to say, I, I want to continue to rejoice in that. I want to continue to build her up that way. I want to continue to hold him up that way and highlight them, not just to my spouse, but also to people around me. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I'm the luckiest woman in the world. I am so blessed to have my spouse in my life. Those should be common words that we say around each other because we are so blessed to have that person. But it's not just what we say, it's how we live. Ephesians 5. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. We talked about this last week as well, but self-control and patience are so closely tied together. Husbands and wives are the single greatest influence as far as human relationships go in the world. Your spouse whether you want to admit it or not, and you as a spouse, whether you want to admit it or not, will have the greatest impact on shaping who the other is. And we're told in Ephesians 5 that we're to use that influence, we're to use that impact that we have on the other to make them what Christ has made them, to make them holy, to make them spotless, to make them without blemish, to make them blameless. Isn't that amazing that God works in you and in me to show sanctification by the way that we say good things, by the way that we use self-control as far as what we do or don't do with our spouses. This is a, a huge responsibility that we're called to do, and yet I want you to be encouraged because this is the gospel. This is good news. You might say, how so? Titus chapter 2 has these words. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What I hear in that passage is what we've been talking about throughout this sermon this morning is that we are not controlled by our evil desires. They do not have the final word, our hormones, our chemicals. The world around us that tells us otherwise does not have the final word, and that's good news. Also, our salvation and even our forgiveness for lack of self-control is found in Christ and in his obedience. We recognize in this passage, as, as we know what all of Scripture says, is that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That he never succumbed to temptation. That he practiced self-control perfectly. And also we know from this passage that one day all the temptations, all the evil desires that we might have, all the difficulty will end and Christ will appear and he will take us to be in glory with him forever. 
And so as we think about self-control, as we think about marriages, as we think about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we ultimately set our hope on Christ's self-control. Right? It's not about exclusively what we do, but it's about what He has done for us. And we look to His example. We look to His holiness. We look to His sacrifice. And we recognize that same Spirit that worked in Him is working in us to bring about self-control. Be encouraged. Take heart, friends. God is working in you and through you. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this good word from Scripture. God, thank you for the hope that we have not only in Christ as our Savior, but also in the Holy Spirit as our Counselor. God, help us not to extinguish or, or squelch what he would say, but instead help us to keep in step with the Spirit Help us to follow closely behind you. Help us to know that you're with us at all times and that no temptation is too great for us. God, help us to always look to the cross and be encouraged by what Jesus Christ has done for us. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.